Hello everybody and welcome back to Take One. Okay, the year is coming to an end and it is now time for us to talk about my favorite movies of 2023. That said, before we jump into my top 10, I will give you guys some of my honorable mentions, which are actually number 20 to number 11. So, in 2023, I watched a total of 86 movies that were released in the calendar year of 2023, and these are my honorable mentions. So at number 20, we have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. This film is by far the greatest movie that Marvel has released since Endgame. I adore Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I think James Gunn did a phenomenal job at wrapping up this trilogy and at making an incredible movie with fun, you know, excitement, great action scenes, but also a movie with a lot of heart, with a lot of stakes, and with a lot of sad, profound moments. I, I think this film is, you know, as I said, the greatest movie that the MCU has released since Avengers Endgame, and I absolutely love it. I think it is a beautiful conclusion for the Guardians of the Galaxy, and that is why it's number 20. Then at number 19, we have a small French movie called A Fire. This movie really surprised me. It is a very small, very subtle, very nuanced movie that is all about the vulnerability of artists and you know the vulnerability artists feel when they share the stuff they've been working on for years with anyone around them it is a movie that I could really sympathize with it is a movie that really touched me I, I, I love this movie I think it's very beautiful it's very poetic and you know if you're into small indie artistic films I would highly recommend it then at number 18, we have Blackberry, which in my opinion, it's a great adaptation of a real life story. You know, this film tells the story of the company Blackberry, which is a company that burned incredibly bright, but also incredibly fast. And this film has some great explosive moments, some great interactions, an incredible script, great dialogue, and some amazing, amazing performance. I absolutely loved it. Then at number 17, we have Bo is Afraid, which is the newest film from director Ari Aster. I'm a big fan of his work, and I think Bo is Afraid is another exceptional movie from his. This movie won't be for everyone, because this movie doesn't really make sense, but in my opinion, that is the point. The whole point of Bo is Afraid is for the movie to feel like a nightmare, and in that, it very much succeeded. Bo is Afraid is a nightmare in the sense that nothing makes sense, nothing that you're watching makes sense, and yet everything feels incredibly vividly realistic. The performance from Joaquin Phoenix is absolutely incredible, and the way this film mixes nihilism and existential dread with dark comedy was just absolutely incredible. I personally loved it, but once again, it's not going to be for everyone. It doesn't make sense. You just have to go with it. And at number 16, we have Air, which is the newest film from director Ben Affleck, which also stars Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. I, I loved Air. I thought this was a great story. You know, never in a million years I would have thought that I was going to be interested in a movie about the story behind a shoe, you know, the story behind the Air Jordans, but I was. I thought this film was incredible. I loved it. The script was amazing. The characters were amazing. The dialogue was great. I, the story it was telling was incredibly emotional and incredibly inspirational. I loved Air, amazing movie all around. Then, at number 15, I have a South Korean film called A Normal Family, which is a movie about a family that is anything but normal. This is one of the films that I've already reviewed back in the channel in one of my VIF videos, but I love this movie. I thought the build-up of tension throughout the film was incredible. I thought the characters were very thought-provoking and very well-developed. I loved seeing how the film forced certain characters to change their ethics in drastic ways, but in very realistic ways. I love this movie. I think the ending is incredible. I, I, once again, the build-up is amazing, and I would highly recommend it. Then, following that, a number 14, we have The Holdovers, which, in my opinion, is not only one of the best movies of the year, but it is also one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time now. It is an incredibly cozy and warm movie, but at the same time, it can also be sad and realistic. It, this is not a saccharine movie. This is not just sugar, life is beautiful, everything is great. This is a realistic movie about, you know, the human experience. And the human experience involves some great, beautiful moments, but it also involves loss and change and 
being forced to move on. And this movie beautifully tackles all of that. You know, this movie is basically about a professor and a student that are forced to stay together through Christmas break, through winter break in their school. And then throughout the film, you see both of these characters learning from each other, growing as people, getting together, creating a bond in a very realistic, beautiful and charming way. I love the holdovers. Then at number 13, we have Killers of the Flower Moon, which is the newest film from the one and only Martin Scorsese. I love Martin Scorsese. I adore his films and I very much loved Killers of the Flower Moon. I think this is a great story that deserved to be told. I think the performances were incredible and I very much applaud Martin Scorsese for telling this story the way he did. You know, telling this story of, you know, the events that happened with the Osage Nation, the story that Killers of the Flower Moon tackles, telling this story from the perspective of of the villains, which is what he did, because, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro, the main stars of the movie, are also the villains of the story. Telling this story from their perspective is incredibly risky, but I love that he did it. It is, it is very unusual. It gave us a new perspective, and it once again furthered some of the themes that Martin Scorsese has liked to develop in some of his movies. Particularly, you know, most of Martin Scorsese films are all about how much power can corrupt you know, he explores that in movies like Goodfellas, in movies like The Wolf of Wall Street, and here he does it once again. But also, you know, the idea of how easy it is to do evil when evil has been normalized. How easy and how simple it is to do horrible, horrible things when those things have become normal from your perspective. And that is something that he very much tackles here in Killers of the Flower Moon. And it is incredibly heart-wrenching it is it is incredibly sad that something like this actually happened but it is a great movie that i very much loved then at number 12 we have may december which is the newest film from director todd haynes and i very much love this movie i thought natalie portman gave the best performance she has ever given since black swan i thought julianne moore was incredible and i thought charles melton just absolutely stole the show. What an incredible supporting performance. I, I genuinely hope he gets nominated for Best Supporting Actor at the Oscars. But I love this movie. It is very melodramatic in the best way possible. But I just think the story is so unique and so interesting and lends itself for so much intrigue and so much buildup of tension. I, I just very much loved it. You know, in this film, Natalie Portman acts as an actress who is meeting Julianne Moore because this character, the character that Natalie Portman is playing, is about to play Julianne Moore's character in a fictional film. That is very intriguing, that is very interesting, and I think it really allowed Natalie Portman to flex her acting muscles, you know? It is hard enough to act as someone else, but to act as an actor who is acting as someone else, that is just a whole other level of difficult, and Natalie Portman did it beautifully. Then, at number 11, my last honorable mention is a Turkish film called About Dry Grasses. This is another movie that I already reviewed in one of my Viv videos, but I absolutely adored this film. Yes, it is very long. Yes, the pacing is very slow. But it is a movie that is imbued with so many philosophical ideas and so many thought-provoking scenarios and conversation that I was just enthralled for the entirety of its runtime. The protagonist of this film is not a nice guy. The protagonist of this film is actually kind of an asshole, but he's a fascinating asshole. He's a fascinating individual, and you just can't take your eyes off of him. Now, that is it for my honorable mentions, which were number 20 to number 11, and now it is time to jump into my top 10, the 10 best films I saw in 2023. And without further ado, at number 10, we have Monster, which is the newest film from director Hirokazu Kuriida. I've been a fan of Hirokazu Kuriida for a very long time, but I genuinely think this might be my favorite movie of his. It is a movie unlike any he's done before. You know, he usually makes movies about found families and, you know, families finding a baby and coming together and they're very sweet and they're very nice. This is unlike anything he's done in the best way possible. I am a big fan of movies that question the idea of is there such a thing as an objective truth and this film very much does that. This film, Monster, for those of you who don't know, is told in a style that is very similar to Rashomon, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon. And what I mean by that is in this film, in Monster, you see the same events, you see the exact same events, the exact same week told from three different perspectives. And it is 
incredible to see how much the story changes, to see how much your perspective changes on certain characters, depending on whose POV you're seeing the story through. I thought this film was incredible. You know, I I can't even imagine how hard it would be to write a script like this, you know, a script that works three different ways in from three different perspectives and that depending on what perspective you're seeing it, you just take something completely different from the story. I I love this movie and I thought the ending was incredibly thought-provoking and just You know, as soon as I left this movie, you could just hear people talking amongst themselves about that ending. Then, at number nine, we have one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. I freaking love this film. And that is a South Korean movie called Past Lives. This movie had me in tears for a lot more than I would like to admit. By the time that this movie was over, there was not a single dry eye in the theater... Pretty much everyone was crying. Everyone around me was crying. You could hear people sobbing everywhere in the theater. And there is a reason why this movie is heartbreaking. It is beautiful. This is a story of two people who, according to everyone, were meant for each other and should be with each other. But for different reasons, they can't. And that is what makes this movie so tragic, so sad, and so heart-wrenching. It is a beautiful, beautiful film with some incredible performances, some great monologues, some amazing dialogue, some impeccable cinematography, and I would highly recommend it. Then at number eight, we have a movie that was one of my biggest surprises of the year, and it is a film called Rye Lane. I absolutely adore this movie, and one of the main reasons why I love it so much is because this film is just one of the most energetic, stylish, unapologetically itself movies I've ever seen in my life. When you're watching this movie, you just feel electrified. The performance are electrifying. The cinematography is electrifying. The editing is electrifying. This, The pacing of this film is so fast. It's so much fun. It's so playful. It's so colorful and vibrant and alive that this movie just made me happy. For those of you who don't know, this is a simple story. This movie is all about two, two guys, you know, a man and a woman. And they meet each other and they talk. The whole movie is basically them just talking, having a conversation, and kind of falling in love with each other. So in a way, you know, you could say that on paper, the story of this film is kind of similar to stories from movies such as, you know, Before Sunset and, you know, Before Sunrise. Films that are also very much about two characters meeting, having a conversation, and kind of falling in love. What makes this movie different is its style. Is Yes, it is a simple story about two people having a conversation and falling in love but told in a style that is honestly similar to the style of everything everywhere all at once. It is energetic, it is hyperactive, it is stylish, it is, once again, unapologetically unique. I adore this movie and I would highly recommend it. Then at number seven, we have The Taste of Things. This is another movie that really, really surprised me. I've already covered this movie in one of my VIP videos, but the point is, this is the movie that has made me the hungriest in my entire life. I think this film is unlike anything I've ever seen before, and that is what I love about it so much, you know? One of the things that I love about cinema the most is that movies can put you in the shoes of characters that are nothing like you. And, you know, I like food. Food's good, but I'm not the biggest connoisseur when it comes to, you know, the culinary arts and when it comes to cooking and when it comes to the subtle art of making food. I I don't know anything about that. So I love the fact that this movie was able to put me in the shoes of a character who is the complete opposite, who just adores cooking and who treats cooking and making food not like a thing that you have to do in order to be alive, but as an art. And this movie just opened my eyes and made me understand why culinary and why cooking can be an art. I adore this film. It is the movie that has made me the hungriest ever. I was just salivating for the entirety of its runtime. The first 20-25 minutes of this film are nothing but shots of people cooking. They are sumptuous. They are delicious. And oh, oh my god, I'm kind of salivating right now just talking about this film and thinking about it. 
I love the taste of things. I would highly recommend it. It's not for everyone because it's not a story-driven film. You know, if, if you're coming into this movie looking for a story, looking for a plot, looking for plot twists and, you know, wild character arcs, you're not going to get that. This is a subtle movie about how cooking is an art and the movie is called The Taste of Things for a reason. Then, at number six, my sixth favorite movie of the year has to be Barbie. And what can I say? I absolutely adore this movie. I thought the performances from everyone involved were absolutely incredible. The I'm Just Ken musical number is one of the best things I saw all year. Amazing. I can't wait to hear Ryan Gosling performing at the Oscars, and I hope he does. I hope they nominate I'm Just Ken for best song. But yeah, I adore this movie. And what I love the most is the way this film was able to balance, yes, you know, having a very deep and profound message, but also being a lot of fun. And this movie's both of those things at the same time, and it does it effortlessly. On top of that, all the technical aspects of this film are through the roof. In particular, the sets. The sets and the costume design are incredible. In my opinion, you know, Barbie Land and the sets that Sarah Greenwood and Katie Spencer constructed for this film are just some of the best sets I've ever seen in any movie ever. So yes, I adore Barbie. It's, you know, one of the funniest films I've ever seen. I, I just I just love this movie. It, it's so pink and colorful and fun and energetic and deep and meaningful and... It's, it's Barbie. What can I say? Greta Gerwig, you did it again. I love this movie. Then, at number 5, we have John Wick Chapter 4. I'm a big fan of the John Wick franchise. I love the John Wick movies. But in my opinion, John Wick Chapter 4 has to be the best in the entire franchise. Keanu Reeves absolutely killed it. And I thought this movie was incredible. Some of the stunts in this film are absolutely mind-blowing. I have no idea why there are no stunt awards at the Oscars right now. But yeah, this movie had j just had my jaw dropped on the floor for the entirety of its runtime. The visuals are insane, the cinematography is impeccable, the music's amazing, the sound design is incredible, and the set pieces are so freaking good. Dude, that scene where John Wick is fighting in that house and the camera goes to bird's eye view POV and you see all the action from on top of everyone is just... One of the greatest moments in any action movie that I've ever seen. I adore this film. I thought the ending was poignant and powerful and a great conclusion for the John Wick story. I loved it. Incredible, incredible film. One of the best action movies I've ever seen. Then at number four, my fourth favorite movie of the year is also a movie that I've already reviewed in the channel in one of my Viv videos, and it is Anatomy of a Fall. What can I say? I love this movie. I am a sucker for courtroom dramas, and I think Anatomy of a Fall is one of the best courtroom dramas I've ever seen. Not only that, but in my opinion, it is a courtroom drama in its purest state. You know, in this film, you see the entirety of a courtroom case, you know, from the moment someone gets killed to the very end. And the way this film just puts you in the shoes of jury members is absolutely amazing. This is, once again, another movie that is asking itself that question of, is there such a thing as an objective truth? And I, I love that. I, I love those ideas. I love the philosophical ideas that this movie brings forward. And the way this film explores the subjectivity of perception was just absolutely incredible. Also, some of the best performances I've seen all year. Not only from the humans, but also from the dog. The dog was amazing. <laughs> absolutely incredible. I loved Anatomy of a Fall. It's one of the best of the year. Then, at number three, my third favorite movie of the year is one of the most powerful movies I've ever seen in my life that is also incredibly depressing and incredibly hard to watch. It is a movie unlike anything I've ever seen. It is extremely experimental, extremely transgressive, extremely Brechtian, and alienating. And of course, I'm talking about The Zone of Interest. The Zone of Interest is just unlike anything I've ever seen before. You know, for those of you who missed my review of The Zone of Interest in a previous video, I'll just briefly explain... The Zone of Interest is not really plot-driven, it's not really story-driven. This is a slice-of-life movie where we're following a day in the life of this family. And, you know, we're following them as they do their, their daily stuff. The only caveat is that the family that we're following is a family of Nazis during World War II. And they live right next to Auschwitz. This is a hunting movie that I haven't been able to stop thinking about since I watched it. It is... You know, on paper, it might appear to be a very simple movie, 
but it is an incredibly philosophically rich movie that asks some questions that are, in my opinion, quite frankly disturbing. So yeah, the zone of interest is not for everyone. It is extremely hard to watch, and it is a movie unlike anything I've seen before. That said, it is so philosophically rich and so unlike anything I've ever seen before that it just, it haunts me to this day, and I can't stop thinking about it. Then, at number two, my second favorite movie of 2023 is also by far the best comic book movie of 2023, and that is, of course, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. The Spider-Verse movies are amazing. I love both of them, Into the Spider-Verse and Across the Spider-Verse, and I can't wait for Beyond the Spider-Verse, but this movie, Across the Spider-Verse, just completely blew me away. It is not only one of my favorite superhero movies of all time, but it is also now one of my favorite animated movies of all time. This film is a great example of a movie that is equal parts, you know, fun, unadulterated joy, but also a piece of art. This film is just incredible from every perspective. The animation at display in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is honestly mind-blowing. The way each character has its unique artistic style. Each character, each universe is drawn different, is created in a different ways. Some characters are animated in different time frames than others. It is just insane the way they, they made this movie and I absolutely love it. I thought it was an incredible, incredible movie and... It is a part one, it is a lot of build-up, and I can't wait for part two. The cliffhanger at the end of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was one of the best cliffhangers in film history, if you ask me, so I can't wait for part two. That film can't get here soon enough. And then, at number one, my favorite movie of 2023, the film that, in my opinion, was the greatest piece of cinema out of everything that came out this year, is, without the shadow of a doubt, Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. I'm a huge fan of Christopher Nolan. I adore his body of work, but in my opinion, Oppenheimer is the best movie he has ever made. It is an incredibly ambitious movie. You know, to tell the story of the father of the atom bomb, you know, to tell the story of the creator of the atomic bombs that ended up leading to so many deaths at the end of World War II is just an incredibly challenging and ambitious proposal. And Christopher Nolan pulled it off expertly. I thought the way this movie puts you in the shoes of its main character, you know, the way it puts you in the shoes of J. Robert Oppenheimer was honestly incredible. You know, the surrealist glimpses that we get every once in a while of, of stars and neutrons and, and atoms and elements and space and all of these glimpses that we get of Oppenheimer's mind are just absolutely amazing. Also, you know, the fact that we are put so much in the shoes of the main character allows for some amazing scenes that, in my opinion, are some of the greatest scenes in film history. The Trinity Test, you know, the, the, the scene of the Trinity Test is, in my opinion, one of the greatest scenes I've ever seen in the history of cinema. That minute of silence after the bomb explodes, where we just see the reactions of everyone involved, and we see the reaction of Oppenheimer simultaneously being proud, sad, scared, happy, excited? It is just such a complex performance from Killian Murphy. And on top of that, the narration of the famous quote of, you know, I have become death, destroyer of worlds. It's just one of the greatest moments in film history. And then the scene where Oppenheimer is giving that speech after, you know, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is honestly haunting, you know, the way we as viewers are able to see what's going through his head. You know, we see dead bodies, we see charred skeletons on the floor, we see people with skin falling off of their faces. It is just haunting, incredibly powerful, and once again, one of the best scenes I've ever seen. The way this film handled the two different storylines, you know, the black and white storyline and the color storyline was expertly. The performances in this movie are also absolutely incredible. Robert Downey Jr. killed it, Matt Damon, Emily, Blunt, oh my god, everyone. And of course, the one and only Killian Murphy. I can't imagine something as difficult as acting as J. Robert Oppenheimer, but I think he pulled it off perfectly. This is a character that is written with regret, pride, hope, and fear all at the same time, and I can't say it enough, Killian Murphy just gave, in my opinion, the greatest performance of 2023. I'm definitely rooting for him for Best Actor at this year's Oscars.
So yeah, I adore Oppenheimer. I think it is one of the greatest biopics ever made. I, I think it's one of the greatest and most important movies ever made. I adore this film. I love the way it's told. I love the visuals. I love the performances. I love the music. Oh my god, the music is just absolutely incredible. This is honestly a movie that blew me away, and I... I haven't been able to stop thinking about it ever since I watched it. This is a monumental piece of cinema, unlike anything else that came out in 2023. It proves, once again, why Christopher Nolan is definitely in the conversation as one of the greatest directors of all time, and it definitely deserves being my number one favorite movie of 2023. And that is it. There you have it, my top 10 movies of 2023. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I was able to watch 86 movies that came out in 2023. That said, there are still some that I'm still missing. You know, by the moment of me recording this video, there are still some 2023 films that I haven't seen yet and that maybe could have made it into the list, but I just haven't seen them. You know, for example, I haven't seen movies such as Poor Things, American Fiction, The Iron Claw, Maestro, The Boys in the Boat, Ferrari, All of Us Strangers, Freud's Last Session, The Color Purple, Wonka, and many more. So yes, even though I did watch a bunch of movies that came out in 2023, heck, I watched 86 and that is still a lot, there are still movies that I'm missing and who knows, maybe some of those would have made it into this list. But that is it for this video, I hope you all enjoyed it, goodbye. Ooh.